Hi, everyone. I'm Pip from Seymour Digital Media. You're listening to Know How Marketing Lab podcast. This podcast brings together different experts in marketing from our Facebook group, Cyberpunk Geeks Marketing Mixer. Each week we get on here and we talk about something search marketing like Google ads or SEO, social media marketing from Facebook to TikTok or website marketing. If you're a marketer or aspiring marketer, a business owner or entrepreneur, this podcast for you. We're gonna share the best SEO, search, social, uh, and website strategies. We share tips and hacks, Google ad strategies, what's going on in the current market. Each week we discuss something exciting and awesome in marketing. This is Rena Little from LittleWorks Indie Media for Geek Speak. And Greg, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes, I am Greg with Original72 Creative, and we're a full-service website graphic design and digital marketing firm in Vancouver. Perfect. And today we're heading into a topic that is super near and dear to my heart and my nerves, actually, (laughs) and that is marketing strategy. Yeah, the importance of a marketing strategy. I don't know, what do you want to get into first? Well, first, I'd like to talk a little bit about why it's important and what happens when there isn't one. So basically, when you think about how to organize your marketing, there are two types of things that you want to think about. One is strategy and one is tactics. And sometimes people get those two things confused. They'll say, oh, I want to run a bunch of Facebook ads, and I'm going to run some TikTok ads, and I'm going to send out a newsletter. Those are all tactics, but the strategy needs to be cohesive. And there are a couple of reasons for that. Um, Do you want me to just jump in or do you have something to say? Yeah, go for it. Okay, cool. So basically, a strategy is how you organize your tactics so that you're actually organizing your tactics to fulfill a particular goal in your business plan. Uh, or your sales goals, anything like that. So it could be could be sales goals. It could be maybe you're some uh, an organization that sends out information and you're actually just getting the word out. Whatever that is, it has to kind of come from a top level. So your business goals usually turn into a marketing plan, and that marketing plan usually gets organized in the digital realm as part of a part of a bigger marketing plan. Because obviously there are some things that you might be doing that are not digital, like speaking engagements or trade shows or things like that, brochures, the stuff like that. But what you want is to have everything cohesive for your yearly plan, your quarterly goals, your monthly goals. And the, there's a really good reason for that. It's not just so that you're organized and it, it's not just so that you might actually hit your goals or come in, this, in the realm of your goals, but it's also because if you're doing everything as verticals and tactics, then Generally, you can come into this situation where if you have one person looking after your Google ads, one person looking after your website, and one person looking after your social, and they're not communicating with each other, and they don't have an overall plan, or they don't have an insight to your overall plan as a business owner, then you can have things like overlap of tactics. So for example, a social person may be blogging for you with one goal in mind and then your SEO company might be blogging for you with a different tactic like using it differently or a different goal in mind so you might be doubling up on your services you might also have big huge gaps of things that aren't on your radar that you might want to be doing that you're not doing because you don't have anyone sort of looking over that nice plan so while you want specialists on each vertical you might want somebody looking after the complete plan and it might be you as a business or small business owner and it might just be one of your team members one of your service providers does that do you have any questions about that yeah no what you were going on about was definitely i'm on the same page for the exact reason what you were talking about was um if everybody is just working on their own and doing their own thing and don't have a, a cohesive plan all their voices are going to be projecting different for your business and you yeah. don't want that you want your you yeah. want your vision and, and voice to be the same tone throughout everything that you do whether it on, be online or offline it's really important to, um, to to have it now i have a couple of examples of how that goes wrong sometimes and what that looks like so people okay. really sure. get a good it. understanding 
So yeah. for example, I think I spoke about like this was part of my example. There was one client that I had and and ultimately when you have a cohesive marketing plan, you also have a really nice cohesive brand going out, which I think is what Greg was getting at with your voice at different voices and and that kind of thing. It also Im- Im- impacts your branding and and how your branding is perceived in the world. So in this one particular case, this was a real estate agent. They had us doing the social media. They had another company do, company doing the SEO work. And so the, that company was blogging and their blogs were SEO forward. So they were really organized according to keyword ranking, which meant that the content was less, less interesting, for example, or less relevant, really. So for example, they wanted to rank in Vancouver for Vancouver events. That was their keyword that I could figure out from their blog. And it was November and they had included events in Vancouver that had already happened in for Halloween. And then they mm-hmm. had events that weren't coming up until February for Chinese New Year. So that kind of content is like a waste of a keyword in a way for me because it's irrelevant bad reading, terrible user experience, and not good for your brand. <laughs> and yeah. it also was was lacking in branding because that company wasn't concerned about putting up a featured image. So when we were doing the blogging for the social side, we were blogging for readers in addition to SEO. So, you know, we had a beautiful photo, we had a really nice article that was relevant, and we had all the keyword stuff organized, keyword on page SEO markup and all that stuff. So their blogs were seriously contrasting to our blogs, which made for a really weird user experience on their website. And if people signed up for their newsletter or their RSS feed for the, the blog posts, it doesn't really make sense. And so, so that's that kind of, that's one example. Um, and then the other example that always comes up, especially with Google ads, is that when you're working with your social person, your social person is going to sort of organize you in terms of like, what content do we want to feature? What is our promotion? What is our goal for that month or, or quarter or whatever it is? And we'll be focusing on messaging around that in social. And then we found out that the, the, um, the Google ads people were focused on a completely different goal. Like they were actually not working at all with any of the content and landing page that we were featuring. And so it Mm. creates like this disruption. Like if you're going to create a goal for your business and then you don't have one major aspect of your ads team working on that goal, then are you going to reach your, your goals at all? Because social generally can't do everything by itself. It's, it warms up audiences and it performs a big function in your funnel if you're organizing it that way. But Google ads are an excellent part of that, should be part of that same funnel, not not doing their own thing. You know, so the goals were not really hit in that quarter. Uh, whereas when I work with companies where we're actually using a coordinated uh, um, effort, and it doesn't mean that I have to do all the work for my clients. I work very well with other service providers, absolutely. But when it's a cohesive goal, then those numbers we can blow out of the park way better. You know, like we just really succeed when we're all we're all moving down the same path with the same branding, the same message, the same goal. And we can really help small businesses in a much more profound way when it's all cohesive. When it comes down to it, I think from my perspective, I feel like people really want to be told what they need to do yeah um so the marketing plan will do that right like there's no question in what everybody's doing if they know what the end goal is i i was gonna um try to get into a little bit of how to go about you know defining what your marketing plan should be or Right. You know, because you don't just like, well, these are my goals. Like there's there's typically things you, you could do, which is, you know, knowing your company inside and out and what what's your business summary? What's your what's your company all about? Defining that and writing that down so that everybody in the 
in the business knows the mission of the business as well for for that you know having a mission statement having vision uh defining your vision defining uh, defining the the company values all of these types of things will help you in figuring out what your voice is and how everybody in the company will project as everybody goes off and does these little tasks to market so I mean, everybody at the very beginning should really put something together about what their business is all about, who they're going after, those types of things, so that there's a base um, yeah. to work from on defining the rest of what your marketing plan is going to be around the goals of the company. Yeah. So, yeah, those are really great points for sure. And I like to ask my client for their business plan or marketing plan if they've developed one at the beginning of each year do you have a new plan <laughs> do you have a new plan um the other thing that you want to hand off to your marketers and service providers of all kinds is your style guide cuz that's going to give really clear mm -hmm. indication of what kind of visuals we're looking for in our branding what's our palette our color palette so you know, usually you have your palette from your logos itself, and then you have a, an extra palette that you've used probably for your website and that you can use in your marketing, which fonts and um, and what your messaging is. So generally on the style guides, if there are things that you want to avoid, like word specific words, like in the mark in the real estate space, I get asked not to use the word bubble ever for obvious reasons. And so you want to make sure that all of your service providers know that so that they're not sending out ads that you're not necessarily seeing. And then you find out much later that you've broken some kind of rule. Lots of industries are regulated in terms of what they have to say and what they can't say. And, um, and then clients, we usually sort of build upon their brand as we go. So some clients, like if you're dealing with people in the, in, in uh, different parts of the world, different gestures might mean different things and different words have different connotations. So you want to have that all set down as you come across these okay. things, instances, that's usually how it happens is we use something and then it's like, oh no, we can't do that. So we make sure we put it on the style guide so that all the service providers understand and that should be updated. So that's that goes hand in hand with your marketing plan. I feel the the branding or style guide thing is something that's majorly lacking in a lot of small yeah. businesses. It's just one of those things that uh, people don't really put importance on when they're starting their business. And I can and I can understand that. Yeah. I can appreciate that, right? Like spending yeah. money on like defining, you know, your fonts and your colors and and stuff like that seem very much at the very beginning something that is a waste when yeah. there are other things maybe that they deem more important yeah. but as your business grows it becomes more and more important yeah. and one of the one of the reasons i'm you know doing what i do today um, because prior to this i had a another company with um, with staff and and did mainly web uh, and e-commerce uh, sites I realized that so many small businesses don't have this because every time we got a project, I would ask, you know, can you give me your logo? Can you, do you have, what are your colors? What's the style of, of your business so that I could create yeah. a website that yeah. matches your brand and yeah. nobody could give me anything. So I ended up always like defining it for them accumulating that information building the site and then you know pushing them to move forward with what we what we created yeah. and I, I just did that as part of our web design project with them and then so when i left that business i was like this is missing like i want to be someone's full marketing department yeah. where i can go in and i can tweak their logo create their colors give them that style yeah. guide you know, yeah. and, and help them with all of this stuff as well as just doing their website and, yeah. and stuff like that. So I'm I'm completely on board with the importance of having that mapped out as early on as you can. Yeah, I agree. 
Want to know more about SEO? We've got a class for that. Our mission is to educate students about the right tools, techniques, and strategies to grow their businesses using the most up-to-date search engine marketing optimization techniques and tools. Find out more at knowhowmarketinglab.com. Generally speaking, when people start their business, you're right. The priorities are different. They need to get out and start making sales pretty quick. So they need a website. They might need a business card and they need a logo. And those are the things that they're mostly concerned about. And that's correct. If you have a little bit bigger budget, getting that style guide organized is good because it also tells you how to use your fonts. So generally speaking, when you get your your logo from your designer and designers listen up because this is not really user friendly for the clients. What we do is we always make sure usually what in your style guide, the first thing is your logo and the colors in your logo. And then one thing that you notice is how to use position your logo. So it'll tell you how much space to keep around that logo so that it's not butt up against things. But then on the other hand, the designers provide the file package. And when I'm working with a new designer before they hear my little rant, they inevitably export those files from InDesign without any white space around them or empty space. What do you call that? Transparent space around it to provide that buffer for the client. And then so you see them, they put their logo up on Facebook or they put it somewhere and their logo was right against all the edges. And it just, it's just like makes me cringe. But yeah, so that's usually the first one is just the logo colors, the logo fonts and how much space to put around that logo. And then from there, you can add complementary fonts for when you move to your building your website, usually your website developer or a designer will give you complementary fonts that they're going to use and the complementary colors for your palette that go with your logo. Because that's another rookie mistake is creating your website in the logo colors itself, because you really want a logo to pop. You don't want it to be blendy in with the rest of your site. So complementary colors are super important. Anyways, we don't want to get too far down the design section because we have about 10 minutes left, but we do want to cover a couple more. What were the, there was another topic that we had on our strategy. It was, um, what does it look like? The differences between tactics and strategies. And, and what was our last point, Greg? For the most part, the business owner would develop the, all of these guides, the, um, the style guide and the, or well on behalf of you know whoever they're contracting to to do it talk about defining their uh, company mission statement and vision and values yeah. the, the business owner really should be the one that's creating that with yeah. the help of a company yeah. potentially Right. When you say the company, the design company. So um, what I would say is that a designer should walk a client through, a, a business owner through that process, and there should be discussions on that. Usually there's, and most designers always do this, they do an intake form and they establish the, the, the um, personality of the brand during that intake form. Because you'll ask clients things like, how do you want your customers to feel about you? And what is your vision? And what is your mission? So yes, definitely the business owner should be really involved in this unless they have somebody else that they've assigned to with this task that sometimes happens. But really the designer should be walking them through. And then the next person who takes that branding document, so it might be a logo designer first, then it might be handed off to a website designer, and then the website designer will add the uh, next layer of information on there because really a style guide can be as small as just the logo to start and then it can grow to be a giant manual of branding like sometimes there are many many pages um, directing every aspect of the company's brand which would include things like customer service how your your people interact with people so for example in my company uh, part of my branding is um I don't want anyone saying no problem to a client instead of you're welcome or mm-hmm. it's my pleasure. Like I, I don't like the no problem comeback or the that kind of thing. So any of that kind of communication, forward facing communication goes in your branding guide. Yeah. Now, a couple of other things I, I can pop off that are important to getting 
a good marketing strategy together would be analyzing your customers or defining your target customers yeah. as well as doing competitor research, both right. very valuable to know before you actually start creating your marketing strategy. Thoughts on those? Yeah, I do. So in my intake form, we always ask about customers. And usually when a, a business owner is really new in their business, they really don't have this locked down. So for example, insurance uh, brokers will always say, uh, everyone's my client. And it's like, okay, well, that's great. And it's true to an extent. But who are your ideal clients? Who do you want to target market to? Be to? Because while the dude down the street needs insurance, and it would be your advice that they get insurance, if they don't have um, a steady income and um, and they have a ton of debt load, then insurance is probably not going to be at the top of their priority list. So, you, so it's not necessarily who are your clients. It's the better question is, who should we be targeting? Who are your ideal clients? And that's really important. And you can have many ideal clients. And in fact, it's instead of creating a wide net and including all of your ideal clients in one grouping, it's especially for digital, it's way better to have a really tight, well understood target market for each type of client. So for example, for my business, I have my 24 week social media training. I know that a lot of women like that, a lot of women entrepreneurs, a lot of solopreneurs, a lot of small businesses like that. So I'll have a target market for my solopreneur woman uh, client, and I'll have a target market for my small business client. They might have a team and a, and a location, and they're completely different, but I'm going to market separately to both of those target markets. So definitely knowing, I think some people call them avatars, your client avatars. Like, who are they? What's their demographic? Like, really as specific as you can. Then that can really help, especially when you're dealing with a service provider. If you've already worked out that, then I can just go straight to targeting the ads to that and creating a new, new audience for those people. If I'm left up to my own devices, generally with the experience that I have, I can come up with your target market and your avatar without you. But sometimes there are some markets, like for example, I was dealing with a tool company a couple of years ago, and he was like all about the white collar hobbyist. And I'm like, oh, I would have never thought of that by myself. So I know hobbyist for sure, but I wouldn't have pinned them into the white collar demographic necessarily. So that was a super helpful tip that the business owner really knew already. So that was, and I could just move forward with targeting them rather than taking the time to figure that out in my, in my work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, one thing I was going to say about, um, as you mentioned, casting a wide net type of a thing, as opposed to sort of trying to niche down and, and really target the people who your business is, is really going for is the fact that if you're casting that wide net, you could be getting a lot of potential customers that aren't who you're really looking for. Yes. And the fact that these people really waste a lot of time. Yes. Uh, because you do have to, you know, if they're reaching out or, or you're reaching out to them and talking to them and it's not the person you're looking for, that's wasted time. Yes. So casting that wide net and getting a huge amount of people when only a handful of them will end up turning into, into clients yes. um, is wasting a lot of time and resources to deal with all those. And that's the importance of making sure you are targeting the very specific people that the business is going after. That's right. And ad spend. So when you said resources, I just want to clarify. Ad spend, That's actually uh, yeah. ad spend because people understand ad spend money <laughs> much better than resources. And you're right, because if you're casting a wide net and even if you help yourself out by creating a self-selection, a self-opt out. So generally speaking, the best way of marketing is to target your ads really specifically so that you're not getting a whole lot of traffic to your site and then a whole lot of drop off. You want to reduce that drop off traffic and you do that by becoming more niche down in your targeting. And then you can also do a self-selection. So on your landing page, 
you want to actually be saying things like, I'm not a copywriter, so I'm just saying that this really roughly, but you want to have things like, for example, for my my um, training package with the um, uh, female solopreneurs, I would actually say, are you a solopreneur who is, and if I'm only targeting women, I don't actually have to say, are you a woman entrepreneur? I can just say, are you struggling in this way to get more clients? And um, Mm -hmm. do you have a, you know, you can actually help self-select. You can say, have you been in business for a while? Um, Or you can find some other way to help them self-select. Are you doing marketing on your own? Do you want training? So if I'm trying to put them in a training thing, then I'm like, if you haven't hit that point where you're subcontract, where you're contracting out your, your marketing work, then this is the course for you. This is a solution for your problems. It's going to get you on board. Uh, faster. So you do that self-select. If you don't want people DIYing, then you might want to have like, we've got this really great quiz on a uh, uh, engineer's website, and it helps people navigate which permits they need from the city. But it also tells them at the end of the, the quiz, you need to get this permit and you can do this on your own, or you can hire uh, just a regular contractor. You don't need a, you don't need an engineer. And on the other end, it's like, you need this permit and we can help you get that book a session, a discovery session with us. And so you funnel the people that fire you for that job into your mm-hmm. booking, booking system. And you funneled all of those other people, the DIY people, uh, back to the city and given them the answer of what they need, which is also really helpful. So you're also building, you know, goodwill with people that might need you in the future. Mm hmm. Well, we're uh, creeping up on half an hour here, but our, mm-hmm. I wanted to uh, recap uh, because we sort of got to the point where you touched on budget um, as we talked about, you know, that wider net and having blown a budget on people who wouldn't be uh, clients. And so the importance of that marketing strategy, defining all of these things will ultimately help you target the right people and stay within your budget. And not go not go over budget with all of these other useless contacts that <laughs> maybe maybe in your fish net. Yeah, and when you actually have budget that's working for you, then you start to scale up that budget if you want to open up that faucet bigger to get more clients in. Or you can start doing things by instead of wasting all of the money on on one thing, you can start to you know add other verticals to your mix, which is always great. Because not everybody is found in the same spot. Mm-hmm. No, not everybody's on Facebook. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. I mean, we didn't even touch on that uh, part of, no. well, I guess we did defining your target customers and and where they would be to decide yeah. on, you know, where yeah. you're going to spend your marketing dollars. Yeah. I'm almost feeling like we now that we've gotten this far, we could probably do a part two on strategy and really get into sort of part two coming your way very soon let's do that let's do that (laughs) so what's happening next week greg do you know oh yeah eh? i know right (laughs) it's only because i don't have my browser up at the moment yeah i'm looking oh you know what i have no idea (laughs) okay tba i don't have it open okay all right well we'll we have another topic next week yeah tune in and if and you have, find out, it will be a surprise. Yeah, and we are streaming live from the Facebook group, Cyberpunk Marketing Geeks, if you want to join us there. If you have any questions about strategy, put them in the comments below, and we'll be happy to address them in our part two, and we'll also leave you an answer um, as a reply. And join us next week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Mm-hmm. Bye-bye. The conversation never stops in our Facebook group, Cyberpunk Geeks. Join us at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash cyberpunk geeks to ask your questions, meet new friends, and learn even more about search, social, and websites. 